my introductions this morning. Oh yeah, that's Lou, and this is Ron. Now, what we're going to do here in this Q&A is I'm going to read some of the submitted questions, and then when we've gone through the submitted questions, we'll take questions from the audience. First question is for Ron. Can U.S. tariffs ever make sense even to bring into line bad actors like China? <laughs> Not in my estimation. <laughs> Tariff or taxes, and we pay them. It makes no sense. <laughs> it makes no sense. I think tariffs are, are are not worth even giving it serious thought. It really doesn't improve things. Temporarily, it's a good political stunt, and it seems like it's logical. Well, we're going to punish them, and we hear hear it announced that if we put all these tariffs on China, you know, just think about it. All that money China is going to have to give us, and I think that's not the way I understand tariffs. It means that. Uh, that our government is going to take more money from the American taxpayer. I usually summarize it by saying, what do you have it against poor people who would like to buy tennis shoes for $15 and you want them to buy <laughs> tennis shoes for $100? So I would say, no, no, no tariffs. And it's a tough sell, you know, politically, and it's very popular. It's been around for a long time. But it seems like we went many decades and – most economists, no matter what persuasion they were of, were generally opposed to uh, to the tariffs. But right now, it's been softened, and it amazes me that on the one hand, it's the best economy we've ever had in the history of the United States. At the same time, we're in desperate shape, and everybody is ruining us, and therefore we have to retaliate, and we want to put on tariffs. I think it's foolish. I think it's a big mistake. Mark, may, may I make, make just a sure a quick uh, uh, addendum to that? Um, Frederick Bastiat uh, said that when goods don't cross borders, armor, armies do, and we can see the increased hostility that these tariffs uh, on China have caused between China and the U.S. We used to be friends, trading uh, massively. Now it's uh, hostility. Will it actually lead to a war? We can pray and hope not, but. It's very dangerous from that standpoint, too. Question for Lou. What can we do to counteract the influence of the lamestream media to include Facebook and Twitter? That's a good question. Boy, that's a great question. In fact, we're going to have a conference in uh, Lake Jackson, Texas, uh, with Dr. Paul, where we talk about all the, the alternative media, the good alternative media, as versus the bad alternative media, as versus the evil lamestream media. And um, uh, Dr. Paul's TV show is an important aspect of getting around these people. Um, and we'll, uh, I think that we just need more. We need more uh, websites. We need more um, circumventing of, the, of Facebook and Twitter. And um, there are people who are producing... Uh, competition for them, still very small, of course, but uh, we need to support that as well. And um, it's a tough battle, but I think it can be done already. I think good alternative media uh, attracts a huge number of people, uh, which is why, of course, they're censoring us and uh, trying to put us out of business. Um, PayPal won't um, uh, accept contributions for bad guys and, you know, quote unquote, and, and that sort of thing. But I think it can be done. I think, um, I think there's going to be some good news coming up. I think the left, just this Kavanaugh hearing, uh, has uh, shown that people are upset with them. People are more and more upset with them. They're not believing them. And uh, so this is our time. And, um, you know, the Mises Institute website, LRC website, there's, there's, there's a, we have a lot of readers. We're going to have more readers. And that's the way to do it. Um, but it's, it's a difficult situation, no question. But uh, I think Facebook, uh, Twitter, um, and all the rest of them are actually, we already see them going down. Their stock prices going down, employees leaving them. They're still, of course, extremely powerful. But I think they're more and more being seen as biased and left wing. And uh, people who like that, well, they can, of course, go there. 
but uh, just one additional point, more and more young people don't use Facebook. I mean, people under, under teenagers don't use Facebook. Uh, kids in the 20s tend not to use Facebook either. That's a very different situation than a few years ago. So there's good stuff happening. We just need to do all we can to encourage it. You know, I think Lou has a perfect answer for that, and that's very good, and we should be more optimistic about the alternatives. But, you know, there is an opening. One thing that I, I think we should <laughs> demand is that, that they are, uh, the social media is an arm of the government. But they're also private, so to speak. But the arm of the government, when they start releasing private information to the government, you know, in secret, and they keep spying on us, it seems like there we should deny them from ever getting any funds from the government. And, of course, government funds helped establish them there. So this is not private market, so it makes it more difficult. But under the circumstances, I don't know if we have much more we can do. There's probably at times when they could be uh, reined in by denying funding and and used, uh, you know, to spy on us. But uh, it's, a, it, it's a tough thing, but there are alternatives. And I think back in more, uh, uh, more simpler times when we had maybe three TV stations and a couple newspapers. Well, they were, they were a monopoly then. But what was the answer? You know, there are more radio stations, more TV stations. Then I thought, boy, the Internet's going to be an answer to all this. And to a degree it is. I think the Mises Institute has done great because uh, they're in better shape than, say, uh, the Liberty Report because we still, you know, uh, have um, – uh, we, we, we still make use of it because on there we have a lot of friends, I don't know, 1.3, 1.4 million. And, but all of a sudden many people know that uh, they have done this, you know, with the new rules and regulation. So emotionally there's certainly a mixed va battle in here, but there are times when you think they're using, you know, taxpayers money to use private industry uh, it's a, it is a form of fascism as far as I'm concerned. But in the meantime, we'll do exactly what Lou said. We build the alternative. And even at the origin of our, of our history, they had pamphleteering. And I think of that a lot, uh, modern day pamphleteering to overcome, uh, you know, the organized uh, uh, media. In fact, we have some libertarians who argue that you really can't criticize Facebook, Google, Twitter and so forth because they're private. But of course, I, I think in, in some sense, as Dr. Paul points out, they're, in their foundations, they were not private. They had government money, government help from the CIA's um, uh, firms that give, give uh, money to companies that they like that are starting up. Um, so it's, it's, I think the more we can criticize them, the more we can expose their true nature to people, not call for regulation, obviously, uh, but the more we can criticize them, the better off we are, the more we can diminish their, their, uh, their value. Um, that's important as well. Okay, to Ron. What do you think the most important or biggest issue for our country is or the world today? The protection of liberty. And it's not more complicated than that. Because, uh, but it, it requires first everybody having a general agreement what liberty is all about. And uh, of course, that's the fundamentals of the understanding of natural rights, the right to our life and our liberty, and uh, then applying some rules to it. And the rules aren't complicated. They've been around for a few thousand years. You know, we didn't invent the libertarian rules of non-aggression. You know, a long time they've been talking about uh, no, no lying, cheating, stealing, and hurting people. They've been around for thousands of years. So that's simple rule. And then recognize that everybody is a sovereign person and uh, that it's individual. And I think the big effort that I make is trying to show how much better off we would be. Most people think, yes, but, you know, after 9-11, they would come to me, yes, Ron, you're right about this. Don't sacrifice any of your liberty for safety and security. But you, you don't really have, have that choice. Besides, it is, uh, uh, it, it, it is the, it, the principle of liberty when it's enforced. That's when we do well. I mean, that's when you have the middle class. That's when you have development and, and all this. So it's the protection of liberty. And uh, I think when I gave my last speech in Congress, uh, uh, there was a lot of points that you could make along this line. But uh, in, in, along the line of understanding liberty, I said, uh, you know, the one thing that we really ought to work hard is to understand 
and protect the First Amendment, which means that we should never be closed down by the government as long as we can distribute and uh, exercise our right to explain our position and uh, express ourselves. I, I think then we have to stand on our own merits. We, we uh, don't have to get any help at all. So uh, being able to do that, and that, of course, is why I think the Mises Institute has done such a great job in the midst of all this mess that we're putting on, and more importantly, and I think uh, Lou, Lou is absolutely right. Uh, they're uh, they're giving up on the alternative, and I think some of this chaotic stuff is is really pretty good. And I love to see these statistics when it says seventy eight percent of the people don't trust the government. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> Okay, for Lou, what inspired you to found the Ludwig von Mises Institute? Well, I had known Mises a little bit uh, in the 1960s uh, when I was his editor for uh, bringing back some of his books into print and publishing a, a couple of new uh, uh, monographs as well. And I'll never forget the day that uh, my boss, Neil McCaffrey, the president of Arlington House Publishers, uh, and by the way, his grandson is Matt McCaffrey, who's one of our uh, scholars today, uh, called me into his office and he said, uh, Lou, how would you like to be the editor for Ludwig von Mises? So, you know. so I, I mainly dealt with Margaret von Mises um, in all of this, but uh, um, I'd already had been reading Mises, and this is my relationship with the two of them um, brought me even more interest in his work. And uh, some years later, after his death, and I was working for a uh, think tank at uh, Emory University, and I became concerned that more and more um, the Austrian school as it existed at that time was diminishing in, in, in influence, and that Mises was not getting anything like the, as, as a matter of fact, it happened all during his life, was not getting anything like the attention he should have as a great hero as well as a great scholar. And um, so I, because I was an associate director of this, th of this think tank, um, these two things came together. And I thought, well, I can do this. I can start one of these. So uh, uh, I, after I got, I filled out all the IRS forms myself. I didn't even have a lawyer. And uh, as soon as I got a permission for a, a nonprofit and uh, um, for uh, the ability to receive uh, tax-deductible contributions, I gave my notice and and uh, got going. And it, but it was really it was my concern that the instant that Mises the man and the Austrian school was losing, and it had never been huge, but it was losing the standpoint, losing the uh, influence, the influence that it had, had. And I think today, you know, it's. We've got far more influence. We're still very much a minority movement, but we're hugely influential as compared to those days. And uh, Mises is much better known all over the world. Uh, Murray Rothbard, of course, too. And uh, uh, I first approached Margaret von Mises after I decided to do this and asked her if she'd be our chairman. And she very graciously agreed. And she was not just a figurehead. I mean, she was... Uh, as Murray Rothbard called her, a one-man Mises industry. I mean, she was uh, so intent on all his books being in print, and all his works being translated into as many languages as possible, and she was just a huge help. Uh, Dr. Ron Paul uh, was a gigantic help in, uh, in financing the Institute in the beginning and uh, using his influence to help us. And uh, Murray Rothbard agreed to be our academic uh, uh, head. How could we lose with those three people? So uh, uh, we didn't, and so we're still small, but far better than we were. And uh, Mises is known all over the world today. His works are known. Rothbard's works are known. And uh, in that way, we're making just gigantic progress. So uh, I have to thank Murray and Margaret, uh, Ludwig von Mises as well. Uh, maybe they're looking down on us um, for all that they did. I can attest to the fact that I was a poor graduate student here at Auburn University when Lou drove up in an old station wagon with a few boxes of pamphlets, and I was really worried because his car was older than my car. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Okay, this is to both of you. What do you think about President Trump's um, actions and statements on Venezuela, the economic and per personal sanctions imposed, but as well as um, the military option, which President Trump still uh, says is on the table? It doesn't quite fit uh, my qualifications for a non-interventionist foreign policy. <laughs> Way too much intervention. It doesn't mean that we should totally ignore the world and, uh, and not talk about it, but if we're going to export anything, it should be ideas, and uh, it should be exporting, uh, you know, setting an example. So if, there's, if socialism fails down there, uh, it doesn't require our military action to deal with it because that has something to do with socialism, fascism, too. But you can't you can't spread ideas like that. and these threats and intimidations and sanctions they're just horrible it un, it, it undoes the whole thing so uh, no I think it's completely wrong but uh, wait till tomorrow it might change you know his uh, position might change you know so we we don't know but on Venezuela as as he is on Iran and pretty consistent uh, way too much involvement and uh, at one time uh, we said something positive on the program about you know uh, opening up the doors in a conversation with North Korea and that was back and forth and now that's a lot better than it was but uh, obviously there's no consistent pattern uh, that is why uh, we at the uh, Ron Paul Institute believe that uh, promoting the best we can the principles of, uh, of uh, non-intervention uh, is very important in foreign policy and the rest of the uh, you know personal liberties as well as economic policy but it's um, it's it's something that I think uh, we have too much involvement and and the one thing that uh, I've helped uh, or at least I participated in and tried to change is it was traditionally uh, not a bad idea to use isolationism as a description of our viewpoint, but politically, I didn't like it because it sounds like you don't want to deal with the world. And I think libertarians really want to deal with the world on voluntary terms instead of on their military terms. So I want to be very much engaged, travel, trade, sales, and prevention of wars, Lou points out. So I think that uh, is quite a bit different. So I don't want to isolate. But if somebody wants to be isolated as an individual or a country that doesn't want to do much, yeah, they still could do it. But uh, no, I just uh, I just like the idea of non-interventionists, mind our own business. You know, if it's pretty amazing that uh, there was one time in uh, looking at uh, H, uh, George W. Bush's uh, campaign and career, and I thought, wow, maybe this is okay. And that was in the year 2000 when he expressed his foreign policy. If you go back and look at it, it was non-intervention, mind our own business and, uh, you know, treat people differently. But of course, that was just talk to appeal to a few people who might have libertarian leanings. But uh, someday, matter of fact, I'm not even too pessimistic about this. It's, it's a mess, but it costs a lot of money. And if you think that it's going to last forever, we're kidding ourselves. Because all you have to do is think about how powerful those Soviets were. But they came crashing down for financial, economic reasons. And uh, I don't think that's we're that far off. So therefore, we are going to have an opportunity to spread the economic message of uh, libertarianism as well as a foreign policy, because we're not going to be able to afford it. And there, there's going to be a point when they will just not accept our dollars and that will be good news. One interesting thing about Venezuela, the U.S. has been attempting to overthrow the government ever since the socialists came to power. Um, and they've staged coups, they haven't worked, but it makes it easy for the socialists to say, it's not our policies that are causing all the disruption here in Venezuela. It's deliberate U.S. and CIA intervention, which, of course, is going on. So it's another reason not to intervene. It gives the socialists an excuse for their failures. Um, and it uh, seems to me the Venezuelans are coming down on their own. The idea that the U.S. needs to invade them and kill a bunch of people um, strikes me as an outrageous idea. And, of course, there are many outrageous ideas in Washington. Okay, for both. Uh, excuse me. Uh, this is for Ron. As a champion for liberty, I'm sure your political career has had many difficulties, but what do you think your biggest political successes have been? You know, I, I think I think there's several, but they're nothing real dramatic. It, it, it's not like uh, last week we just audited the Fed. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, no, no, no successes like that. But I feel good about the idea now that compared to when we had our last bust in 09, that there's a lot more people in this country now very critical and questioning you know, the authenticity of that secret organization, the Federal Reserve. So I think they're, they're more on the defense. They're still very, very powerful and all. But I tell you what, I think the average person is much more aware of it. And uh, I've been impressed when I go to the college campuses, there's still a lot of people on campuses will be very excited about, uh, you know, talking about the Fed and how, how bad it is. I think there's, uh, you know, been a little contribution on, uh, on, on the foreign policy, uh, obviously, about uh, how disastrous the wars have been. But I think there's been some other successes of positions not only I have taken, but the libertarians have taken. I think we've made great progress on the war on drugs. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's amazing to me because uh, I remember, you know, I was out, I, I was there for four terms and decided this place isn't for me. I'm going back to medicine. So I went back for 12 years and then I don't know who pushed me or why I did it, but I ran again in, in 96 after I had identified as a libertarian, ran as a libertarian. And I said, you know what? This is going to be this is going to be something because they're going to talk about drug legalizing drugs. And uh, the first press conference I had for that uh, that uh, candidacy, the first first question out of the press conference is, "What about this legalizing drugs?" I always thought that uh, first it would uh, have destroyed my career in just running for Congress, or it would just sort of bomb. But you know. Um, I, I ran again for Congress, and and uh, it never hurt. So I figured the people are a lot smarter than the clowns in Washington because they think that it's totally, uh, you know, they might agree with, with me on it, but they were just totally intimidated that uh, it would be a total disaster for a political career if you said something like, you know, the war on drugs isn't working so well, <laughs> you know. And I I've, I've finally dawned on me that there's probably so many families that have been touched. Back then, the kids, uh, teenagers were put in prison if they were caught with a little bit of marijuana and things like that. So a lot of people had a lot of concern. So I think they were way far but now legislation is uh, caught up with it and I think it's also done one other thing that I've talked about a lot and that is uh, nullification states even for even the liberals are for nullification <laughs> so uh, so those kind of issues I think there's been uh, a, a little bit of a, more attention given and as an aside I uh, tried to pass out a message to uh, pay more attention uh, to the Mises Institute that's where you'll get the good information let me just mention one thing about dr. Paul's uh, career this is in 2008 uh, when he was running and and uh, there was a Republican debate in in uh, Michigan and all the uh, all the people running against him were saying how dare you criticize our economy? Our economy is great. It's magnificent. It's fantastic. The Republicans are doing great. And, and uh, of course, that wasn't true. But after the debate, he had, a, uh, had a, me a meeting at the University of Michigan with the students. And they had to hold it in the quad because there were 4,000 kids who wanted to come to hear Ron Paul. And they started chanting on their own, end the Fed, end the Fed. And one kid lit a dollar bill and held it up, and he's chanting, end the Fed, and they were all doing it. So it's just one small incident of the kind of influence this man has had on our, on our movement in our country, and the whole world, for that matter, uh, for good. Yeah, let me add one more thing on the drug war, because I, I did spend a lot of time on talking about the stupidity of, the, of those laws. But it was at a debate, I think it was in... Uh, uh, maybe it was North Carolina. It was. I know it was a Christian uh, Republican group, and I thought, well, they'll like me. I'm a Christian and I'm a conservative, but it didn't seem to help because the question was, uh, you know, uh, you know, a loaded question about drugs. You would legalize, a, you know, all all drugs, and uh, so er, even heroin. So I started off by saying, all right, let's let's say we legalize heroin. It's been legal in this country at one time, and the world didn't come to an end. But let's say we legalize heroin tomorrow. How many people in this audience will be tempted to use heroin? 
and nobody put up their hand. <laughs> but they kidded me about that later on some of the interviews. They say, who would have ever thought that Ron Paul could go in in the Bible Belt and, and talk to him about heroin and uh, get a lot of cheers? Of course, that night I got a lot of booze. <laughs> Uh, Lou, you might have tipped your hat on the uh, this next question for you. I know you are adamantly against the idea of voting, but you, do you think we can gradually vote our way to a smaller government by electing freedom candidates, or do we need a revolution? Well, I, I wouldn't say I'm adamantly against voting. I don't vote, and um, I don't think I don't think uh, voting your 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 vote, your individual vote, doesn't count. Because, of course, unless the election is decided by one vote, your vote doesn't matter, and it's a pain in the neck to go into that government office and go through all the, the harassment that they put voters like everybody else who encounters the government through. And uh, uh, I think it's, you know, it's, like a, it's like a sacrament of the state, and I don't choose to accept it. Um, but if people want to vote, you know, go to it. I wouldn't tell you not to do it. Um, but I, I don't think voting is the answer. I don't think, um, yeah, with the exception of Ron Paul. Now, I will say that <laughs> all the votes he got and uh, all the influence that he had, and it's, by the way, worldwide. I mean, uh, I remember Robert, the great uh, economic historian Robert Higgs telling me about his, he was in Brazil and he went into this small village and there was a Ron Paul sign. And then all the kids were interested in Ron Paul, and he's, <laughs> he was just thrilled. So uh, uh, Ron used his political his political position as as a bully pulpit. Um, he used his elections to spread the truth about everything that uh, was facing the country. I don't see anybody else doing that, by the way. Um, but if they do do it, more power to them. Um, but I think voting is the answer to our freedoms. I must say, I don't, and I, as, as Hans Hoppe has shown, the wider the franchise, the more people voting, the less freedom there is. So that we, as a country, we were far better off when, when uh, people had to own property, and for example, just to take one example, in order to vote, um, and as, when now everybody can vote, we have a Leviathan state, and these are not unconnected, these are not unconnected things. Okay, uh, and this is for both of you. In the several decades that you have spent in the liberty movement, are you encouraged or discouraged by the amount and rate of progress being made? Uh, I'm, I'm encouraged. <clears throat> Matter of fact, uh, if I speak to a group of college kids, uh, I talk about the bankruptcy company coming and the wars that we're involved in and all the problems that we have, the attack on civil liberties, and it gets down, uh, you know, my average talk would be, say, 40 minutes or so. And but the last five minutes is to talking about, you know, the answer, uh, because they, uh, they have, well, this is overwhelming. And the answer, of course, I don't think it's complicated at all. Sometimes just to simplify, I said, you know, if you want to start. Uh, just have people uh, read the Constitution and try to use that as a guideline, you know. Uh, but it, it isn't, I don't, I just don't think uh, that the answer is in Congress and, and voting. I don't believe we're going to have all of a sudden an influx of libertarian minded people. We have three, four, five, six, you know, uh, that are that are good and a few pretty good. But that is not the way it's going to occur, even though I do believe that the only real revolution, real change uh, comes from the prevailing attitudes of the people, what they they endorse and that's all system of government. So uh, it's a, it's a, something that uh, uh, I think w will come. And that's where I'm optimistic is the change in attitude and times and and and, and the Internet as bad as it's turned out to be and uh, how challenging it's been and uh, the uh, uh, incident that Lou described to me who and this was uh, even before before much of the campaign had gotten in this was early this was this was a reflection not of me I probably wasn't that well known at that time but that issue was well known but it's well known because Austrian economics and sound money is out there and there are some college kids out there that know about it so I think I think we're uh, making progress. I think there's going to be a collapse. I don't think we're going to transition out of this. And uh, 
I think there's a much better chance, but that doesn't mean I let up and say, oh, okay, we've done enough. But it, it all depends on the education, changing people's minds, and it's young people, and remember, it's not a numbers game. You don't have to have, you don't have to have 51%. You have to have a minority that's uh, irate and uh, are willing to champion the cause of liberty and will out and do it. And I think it's out there, uh, but it still needs a lot more boosting and all, but it will not happen. Uh, that, and I think Lou touched on the real reason is it's a bully pulpit. It's a chance. Uh, you know, I always wanted to deal an issue of ideas. And I had nothing, no way to get involved in the early 70s. Uh, and the Bretton Woods thing was, uh, you know, occurring. So I decided nobody else in Texas wanted to run for that particular seat. So I did it just to speak out, you know. So it was a, it was a vehicle. But I was speaking out on my terms. And it, quite frankly, I thought nobody would pay any attention. And even when I started in the presidential race, I was convinced I know nobody's going to pay attention. So there's something out there. And I think the people are starved for our message and that's why everybody has this obligation you know to go out and do whatever they do and when people ask me what to do and like I have a me you know I have a list of things that you have to do no everybody has to figure out where they're most valuable and uh, even if it's just uh, taking your mailing list and sending them materials and talking to people but uh, every everybody has a, has an obligation I'm sure there's plenty of people in this room have started their own organization and they're reaching a lot of people so that's where the real revolution that's where I'm optimistic I want to say like Ron I'm extremely optimistic and I see it in the young people and just huge numbers of I mean there are far more Austrian economists teaching in American universities today than have ever been the case by many magnitudes Still just a few compared to Keynesians or uh, monetarists, but still it's, it's an advancement. I also see it in the, in the increasing intelligence and character and uh, abilities of the students we're attracting. I mean, they really are extraordinary young people who are going to achieve, who have achieved and who are going to achieve uh, much for, them, for their own careers and for our, for our movement. Uh, so I think, it's, I think that uh, there's every reason to hope uh, as, as Ron points out, far more people are aware of the Fed, far more people are aware of what the government intervention in the economy does. So when the collapse comes, it's not going to be, we can certainly hope, uh, like 29, where, where uh, it's easy for a Roosevelt to come in and establish a dictatorship. <clears throat> Excuse me. We, we, we'll, we have our, we'll have our problems, uh, but we have a much better chance today. And um, we all just have to keep working, keep spreading the word. Start a website, uh, um, compile a mailing list, speak to organizations. There's so much everybody can do to help spread the word, and uh, it's, it's working. Will it be in time? Well, we just, again, have to hope and pray that it is in time. But uh, we're in much better shape than we ever have been, uh, and certainly since the 19th century. Okay, I have the last of the submitted joint questions. Uh, but before I give that, um, I'd like to point out that I asked that very question of Murray Rothbard at the first Mises University I ever went to, and uh, he said very clearly and distinctly, he said that in the short run, he's very pessimistic. If you look around, it always seems like there's plenty of bad things, but he said in the long run, if you look at the long run uh, time frame, he said he was very, very optimistic. Okay, uh, the last of the uh, submitted questions. Uh, if each of you had a genie in a bottle and could ask the genie uh, to fulfill one or three wishes, what would you wish for? <laughs> Abolish the government. <laughs> My, mine would be very similar that all all activity uh, social uh, economic whatever would be on a voluntary basis no coercion okay first question well of course we should be concerned and under the uh, original plan they would have been a lot more important than they are today 
But um, I, I think that uh, the states, it was left up to the states uh, to have individual constitutions, but I'm not quite sure the point. Does that mean uh, shouldn't you worry about uh, the loss of liberty at the state level? <laughs> and I would say yes, that is too. So you just go down. If we uh, if you abolish government, that means you will have a lot less government all the way up and down, and it would a voluntary society is quite different. You have uh, oh, voluntary government too. You have, uh, you know, if you need rules and regulations that are going to be local and they'll be in your uh, housing project or your condominiums or whatever, there'll be some restraints made, but it would all be voluntary, but not by uh, by governments that, uh, you know, have, you know, power that they uh, abuse and which they've been doing for a long time. So um, I, I think they would be developed, uh, they, they would be taken care of uh, in the individual states. Uh, you know, if we if we drastically reduce the size and scope of the federal government and you had much more authority at the state level, uh, I think it would be more more uh, more competitive. I think the uh, uh, people in California would be quite different than the, the people in Texas. <laughs> and uh, the one important thing that if we can get even if we don't get rid of the federal government, but reduce it. I think uh, one thing that we ought to have in this rule, if it's going to be voluntary, is that uh, when a state or state isn't, uh, you know, happy with the federal government, that they have easy access to secession. Yeah. Would a return to the Constitution would just excise taxes? and uh, tariffs be better than what we have today, abolishing income and sales taxes and property taxes. Well, I think almost anything could be better than what we have today. <laughs> so it, it's really um, how much government you want. Uh, if there's still a desire for that much government, uh, then yes, that would be better. The, the tax that, um, that I despise the most is the income tax. Uh, because the income that you have is a reflection of your energy, so and it all belongs to you. Today, the it established principle, no matter what the rate is, the principle is established that your effort that, that you put forth for your own benefit and your family's benefit, the, the results of that all belong to the government. And then the government says what portion you can spend under what condition. So getting rid of the income tax would be a tremendous benefit. Now, if you did whittle it down to a lot less taxes, that um, it would be a big help. But ultimately, um, the way you collect taxes uh, is secondary to uh, it's secondary to the whole principle of spending. I call spending is a tax because. Right now, if the government spends another trillion dollars, like they're going to, you know, uh, this year, another trillion dollars worth of deficits, it, you know, what, what can they do? Raise the taxes? Well, no, they, they can't raise another taxes to balance the budget. Okay, what can they do? They can borrow. They can borrow to a degree, but eventually, uh, you know, even under these circumstances, you know, the interest rates are going to go up. So you have to monetize the debt so that they print the money. But it's all a tax on the people because if you dilute the money, the, the inflation tax goes to the middle class and the poor. So it's the spending that counts. And of course, the spending uh, per precipitates the deficits. So it's, uh, it's, the, it, it's the kind of thing that the spending and the principle and the role of government, how big it's going to be, is the key issue. And uh, quite frankly, I think we're I'm optimistic and we're going to be moving in the right direction and, and salvage a, a lot of the mess that we have. But uh, I don't think we're going to reach, uh, you know, the utopia where there's zero taxes. But we have to aim for the very least amount. And we have to get the government out of the business of regulating our lives, policing the world and running the economy. And uh, you might be able to come up with a tax. I don't think, uh, you know, under those circumstances, whether the user tax is the worst kind of tax in the world. You know, if, uh, if you don't use the highways, why do you have to pay for it? You know, what we right now, one thing at my hometown that I fought in uh, Congress for a long time was uh, the port. The port. You had to always finance the port, the port. And they lobbied it. They got everybody to pay for the port. And we have a port tax in our area. And it's all built for Dow Chemical and all the chemical companies. Why don't 
don't they pay for the port and why don't they pay for the canals? The user tax would get you around a lot of that and save this all this evil lobbying that they come to Washington D.C. What we have to do is uh, you know uh, lobby Congress for the for the bailout. Of course, they've already collected it for that purpose, but they spend it on something else, and so it goes in the deficits. So it has to be that has to be changed. So I think user fees would help. You know, speaking to the uh, the question. Um, it's interesting that the Southern conservatives argued for a what they called a revenue tariff as versus a protective tariff to be the sole source or the ma major source of government funding. And they argued that uh, if you raise the tariff too high to make it a protective tariff, which is what people in the North wanted, uh, that it would cut the income to the government and therefore they would have a incentive to keep it low. They suggested 5%, who knows what if any of this uh, would have worked, um, but that's, it's, a, it's an interesting idea. I think if we just had a 5% a, a tariff and could get rid of all the other taxes, I think most of us would accept that as a pretty good deal. Yes, um, for Dr. Paul, please. Uh, back to China for a, a moment. Given, I'd say their avowed uh, premise that they want to overtake us economically and overtake us militarily. Is there anything that you would do with China to change our relationship? And, and understanding the tariffs, their taxes, and I, I understand all that, but is there anything to combat what China is trying to do against the United States? Well, the one thing I, I think it's easier to say what we wouldn't do, <laughs> and that is to, to confront them unnecessarily. There's, there's no reason why we have to put our Navy in the South China Sea. You know, that's like uh, what would we say if the, the Chinese had their entire Navy in the Gulf of Mexico? You know, we might not like that. So uh, I would say it's more what we shouldn't be doing, and I think continue to offer the branch of trade. Uh, they, they need us to buy their stuff you know but nobody wants to take it into consideration now if you want to sort some of that those trade problems you'd have to look at the monetary system we have license to steal through printing of money we have the we we, we have the monopoly control of the reserve currency of the world and we take this and we export our inflation we send it to china we buy their stuff and we get a, a good prices and it's all china's fault so so the chinese though and what do they do <clears throat> they don't go and <clears throat> Excuse me. They don't go and burn our Federal Reserve notes and shrink our money supply so that we don't have inflation. No, they accommodate us. They buy up our, all our debt, and the process continues. So we have to break that up, and I think the best thing we could do for China is admit the shortcomings on our part, which contributes to it. If they make mistakes and tax their people and different things, that, that's their problem. But uh, I think we would, should work very, very hard to have better trading relationships with with China. And, uh, you know, if you look at the history of China, they generally, they have never been as aggressive worldwide with troops as we are. We're in 170 countries, you know, with military, and we continue to do this. And China is, uh, you know, expressing themselves better because, uh, you know, uh, they, they should probably argue, hey, look, we think we're getting a bum rap. You've given us all this, all this paper, and it's losing its value. So we're tired of this. So uh, my answer to that is not so much uh, of what we would uh, what we would do, but with what we would should quit doing. How do we deal with uh, in the, being free to avoid vaccines if we choose? How do we avoid public schools? And how do we avoid? Okay, uh, and, and I thought a lot about this because you know to turn a switch and reverse it is not going to be very easy. So you have the goal always has to be that you have to allow competition. You have to get rid of the mandate. So Obamacare was really wicked, but the worst part was the mandate forcing everybody into it. And that's the way with schools. Actually, we've improved ourselves with, uh, uh, with uh, you know, homeschooling. I mean, it was worse in the early 80s, and, uh, and, and it's better, but that doesn't mean we're home free. There's always going to be competition. So, yes, there's still, we still, if you're determined to raise your kids outside the government schools, you're able to. And even though you pay twice, you pay your taxes for school, and then you pay for the private school, but the private education, homeschooling education, 
sophistication is so much less that you can survive that. So the most important thing to protect the transition is protecting your right to compete. Money is the one thing that we worked on, competing currencies. The bills that I had on there is no sales tax and no capital gains tax, so you wouldn't have to worry about it. And now we've, uh, uh, recently we've had two, uh, with the Campaign for Liberty that I work on, uh, we had helped to get it passed, I think it was in Arizona and Wyoming, where it's recognized that uh, that gold and silver will not would not be taxed as money. It's ridiculous. You know, if you decide to use American gold coins and American silver coins, you're a criminal because you get hauled in by the IRS, and and then they say, well, uh, you know, if if you if if you have silver coins and you spend it, well, it's worth uh, instead of twenty dollars, twenty five. Oh, you have to pay a capital gains tax. No, you have to you have to protect the the right to compete with the government and there is a bit of that now the did you mention uh inoculations immune yes. yeah that's another one it's tougher and it's getting harder on that but uh you uh there people can get around it but it is very difficult but it should be recognized we need more uh people educated to the danger uh without saying that we don't, we're going to pass a law and nobody's ever allowed to take a vaccine again. You know, that would be ridiculous. But it should mean that if you're going to raise your kids and you understand there could be some danger, the, uh, the, the child can't make the decision. It's your responsibility. But, you know, you hear about p parents going to prison you know, for this, for, for not going along with inoculation. That is a similar to the tax. The government owns us and uh, on vaccines. The government owns the kids. And that's the way, that's why, even though there is no draft now, I'm always fighting to get rid of the registration of the graph. That means the government owns us. Yeah, we don't need you today, but tomorrow we might when we own you. So it's always that message. So we always have to go after that and uh, give them a different message.